Thank you, Stacy. Uh, on behalf of the Minnesota Population Center and the Life Course Center, I'm delighted to introduce Elizabeth Wrigley Field, who's today's speaker in the Minnesota Demography and Aging Seminar. Doc Dr. Wrigley Field is an assistant professor in sociology here at the University of Minnesota and is a faculty affiliate of both the Population Center and the Life Course Center. She has a PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin, and her research focuses on mortality, inequality, and historical infectious disease. Her research has been featured in leading outlets, including the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and Demography. And Elizabeth has a growing list of honors, honors and awards to her credit. She has a residential fellowship this fall at the Institute for Advanced Studies and was the Fessler Lampert Chair in Aging Studies at the Center on Aging at the University last year. She has received numerous research awards, including an outstanding article award from the American Sociological Association section on mathematical sociology for a recent publication in demography on mortality and inequality, the Clifford Clogg Award for best graduate student paper from the American uh, Sociological Association section on methodology, and the Catherine Dupree Lumpkin Dissertation of the Year Award from the Sociology Department at the University of Wisconsin. I should also mention that she has received not one, but four PAA poster awards. Her talk today continues her research on mortality, inequality, and infectious disease, and is titled The Black Deaths America Treats as Normal and How to Stop. So thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing this important work with us. As payment, you'll receive um, a seminar series mug. And without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Wrigley Field. Great, let me get that screen share. Uh, I'm very glad to hear that the mug is not, um, not a thing of the past in the pandemic form of the virtual seminar. Okay. So this talk is about racial inequality in mortality, and uh, I'm mostly going to be talking not about pandemics, um, but I want to start with COVID-19 uh, because the, uh, the context of this discussion is that we are living through a pandemic that is creating historic inequalities. Um, really, what I want to argue is a historic worsening of what was already a vastly unequal um, society. And so I want to show you a little bit about what this looks like specifically here in Minnesota. Um, so hmm, that's not it. There we go. Um, so here in Minnesota, the dominant narrative, um, I think, is that we are this island of sanity surrounded by uh, states who's, uh, who are not managing the pandemic as well as we are. Um, and on the surface, that view has a lot to recommend it. Um, our cases and deaths are relatively well controlled, certainly compared to the states to our east and west um, and earlier to our south. Um, but also on the surface, Minnesota is a more equal state than our neighbors and actually than most other states in the US. So 80% of Minnesota's population is white. And so far, the COVID deaths in Minnesota, 80% of them have been two white people. Um, and so that sounds very equal. And what I wanna show you is what this looks like. Um, this is using uh, death certificate data for the full population of death certificates. Um, my collaborators, JP Leiter, Sarah Garcia, and, uh, and others on different parts of the project um, have death certificate data um, for all deaths from 2017 until the present updated weekly um, for Minnesota. Um, and and you're, you, I should say, are almost the first audience to see these results. And so the first graph that I'm showing you here is confirmed COVID-19 deaths um, relative to the population in the state. So these are death rates per 100,000 by racial and ethnic group. Um, those are the, the length of the bars um, and uh, for three separate time periods, um, the early, the summer, and then the late summer or beginning of the fall in the different colors. And so these deaths are not uniform across uh, racial and ethnic groups, but they look you know, fairly similar. Now I'm gonna adjust these rates for age. Um, and you can see immediately that what is really happening is that Minnesota has a really old white population and really young populations of color. Um, 
Across all states, we have the fifth largest divergence between our average age for the white and black populations, um, which is partly reflecting, of course, that we have a big black immigrant population that tends to be on the young side. Um, and so one thing that's happened is we have this pandemic that, especially in the spring, those navy blue bars was really heavily concentrated in nursing homes and long-term care facilities, uh, which are disproportionately white. And so that's interacting with this really unusual um, age skew um, to create this early wave of deaths that was heavily concentrated in the white population. But when you step back and compare different racial groups at different ages, uh, the risk is much higher for Minnesotans of color. Okay, so that's one kind of adjustment we can do that's um, pretty basic. Um, but now I also want to look quickly beyond confirmed COVID deaths and just ask, well, how many more people are dying this year compared to the same time periods in normal times? And normal times here means uh, the average of the last three years, 2017 to 2019. And what you see here is that in Minnesota's white population, confirmed COVID deaths and excess deaths are really similar. So you can see that by comparing the size of these bars in the top row and the bottom row, and whether you're adjusting for age or not, the COVID and the excess um, are showing a very similar thing to each other. Um, so that doesn't mean that COVID is the only thing that's happening. Um, so for example, from our preliminary investigations so far, we have some evidence that one of the things that physical distancing is doing is stopping the spread of respiratory diseases. Um, in a way that actually has saved a lot of lives in the elderly white population in the state. Um, so these excess death figures are averaging out over some kind of trade-off um, where there's some extra deaths happening and some averted deaths um, due to the measures that were in place to avert COVID um, that are sort of canceling out. But basically for the white population of Minnesota, it looks like COVID is the story here. That's really different for the other populations, especially for the Black and the Native populations here, where confirmed COVID um, is just the tip of the iceberg. So there's this huge well of death that is simply not reflected in our official statistics at all. And I want to show one final COVID graph just to underscore that point. So this is the gap between excess and COVID-19 mortality, and these are from the age-adjusted rates. These are cumulative by week over the course of the pandemic. Um, and what you see is that whites are the pink line here and the gap is basically negligible. In other words, our official COVID statistics uh, are telling us a lot, not just about COVID mortality, but about the overall mortality burden of the pandemic for the white population. But they're really not capturing the overall uh, mortality burden of the populations of color in Minnesota um, at all. And particularly for native Minnesotans where this, um, this gap is enormous. Um, and so we don't know what these excess deaths that are not captured in the COVID statistics are. Some are likely to be COVID deaths that never got diagnosed as being COVID deaths um, because of a lack of testing. Some are likely to be deaths to other causes that happened because of the lack of medical care available um, in the pandemic um, because it uh, partly shut down to uh, avert the spread of COVID. Um, some may be associated with material deprivation, um, especially in perhaps in households that are denied, were denied stimulus money because they had an undocumented member. Um, and we expect those deaths to get worse um, as the unemployment supplement has run out and failed to be replaced. Um, the other thing that, that stands out to me here is that these excess deaths in the native population were very high early in the pandemic. And then you see this leveling out. You can see this better in this graph. Um, this, these death rates were very, very high in the spring and the early summer um, and are almost negligible in August and September. Um, and we don't know yet why that happened, uh, whether, for example, it reflects that medical care facilities opening back up and people starting to seek care again saved lives that were at grave risk. Um, but one potential explanation is a quite tragic one, um, which is that the deaths early in the pandemic were so great that they essentially culled the population that was at the immediate risk of dying from chronic conditions. Um, and so we basically had a shift of deaths over into these early months um, that are now not happening. And so I wanted to begin um, 
with these results to underscore the scale of the crisis that is happening around us. And I think Minnesota in some ways is kind of an edge case um, because the aggregate deaths are relatively equal because overall COVID is well controlled. Um, and to see that even in this context, the scale of inequality is actually quite large, um, which tells us, I think, that um, even in the context of a pandemic where a lot of the public discussion has begun to be about racial disparities, that we're still only seeing a little part of the story in the official statistics and that a lot of the inequality is hidden. Um, so I'm shortly going to shift gears a little bit. Um, and so before I do that, this would be a good time to pause for questions. I can't see the chat. Um, but if anyone wants to say anything out loud or read something from the chat, um, this would be a good time. Then I will move on. So I want to you. I want to step back from the details of COVID to talk more broadly about what pandemics teach us about what's happening in non-pandemic times. Um, and for me, this story really began a few years ago when my colleagues uh, James Feigenbaum and Chris Moeller and I set out to look at the 1918 flu and the time period that surrounded it in the early 20th century. And the story that we started out exploring was actually not about race at all, but was about region. So we were trying to figure out if looking at how infectious mortality declined in different parts of the country might offer some new clues about why that decline happened. So is this a story about public health infrastructure? Is this a story about standards of living? Um, and so we found these big regional differences. Um, and then um, as we looked further at the data, what we found is that what first looked like a story about region, basically about Southern exceptionalism, um, actually turned out to be a story about immense racial inequality that was not just a story about the South, but a story about every region. And so the, the particular stylized facts that crystallized the scale of this inequality for us is, so these are the regional differences that we found. The South is this line on top. Um, and the part I want to draw your attention to is the 1918 flu, which now everybody is very familiar with, um, right, producing this uh, mortality that is uh, almost literally off the charts here. Um, and what we discovered is that white mortality during the 1918 flu was less than black mortality had been almost every single year and actually in total mortality, this turns out to be true um, into the 1930s. And so white mortality here is this darker line, black mortality is the lighter line, and this dashed line is showing you the white 1918 level. And so you can see that as late as 1932, uh, the black line is almost always above that white dashed line. Uh, and similarly for life expectancy, um, the white population's life expectancy in 1918 just plummets. Um, you can see this really dramatic drop. Um, and yet what it's plummeting to is still higher than black life expectancy had been in almost every previous year. And as far as we can tell from the historical data that we have, this was true in every region of the country. Um, so in this graph, the dashed line uh, is white infectious mortality in 1918. And the lines, or the colored lines, are individual cities. And this is the infectious mortality in individual cities, white populations and non-white populations. And the non-white populations at this time were overwhelmingly black. Um, and so you can see that the white lines are, are below the 1918 level. That was a huge jump in mortality, whereas the non-white lives uh, lines, rather, were often um, above it. And the, the reason why we created this graph is actually that when we got these initial results um, in the aggregate, we didn't believe them. We were worried that we had made a mistake. Um, and that reflects, I think, that 1918 holds this sort of role as this singular mortality experience. Um, you know, we in the MPC, um, we know we have a talk probably every year 
that uses the exceptional nature of the 1918 flu in some way, often as an instrument for trying to understand something about early life effects, but in some way uses the facts that this was this really unique and unprecedented um, experience. And so to realize that that was the typical experience um, for a huge segment of the population was actually shocking to us. Um, and we were very worried we'd made a mistake. So we looked at the data many, many different ways. This was just one of them um, to confirm that it was true, uh, but all of them gave the same result. I can see, I think from little notifications that there's questions in the chat. So maybe I'll pause here. And if you wanna ask a question, go ahead. Okay, and I apologize, Elizabeth, but I was just mentioning that my, my audio cut out and I was hoping you could go back to your previous slide and show your primary findings of the 1980 mortality data by race if possible. Yep, so the, the primary finding is just that 1918 mortality for whites, the dashed line here, is lower than the black population's mortality um, in almost every year as late as 1932. Um, so basically, and, and, and this graph is showing a similar story for infectious mortality for individual cities. Um, and so the upshot here is that the 1918 experience for whites was similar to or actually better than the typical year in year out experience uh, for blacks in this period. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, so, so that's the backdrop for me. And this is why I think in around May, I thought to ask the question, well, is this going to be true um, in the COVID pandemic as well? Um, so, um, so I knew that, um, racial inequality in mortality is still extreme. Um, and so, um, so what these graphs are showing are the dashed lines here, uh, the white dashed lines are the best ever black mortality levels. Um, and they're showing that the lowest ever black mortality is still higher than white mortality was 20 years ago and the lowest ever black life expectancy is low, sorry, the highest ever black life expectancy is still lower than white life expectancy was 30 years ago. Um, so one way you can think about this is that the scale of racial inequality in mortality or in life expectancy is similar to as if, um, if blacks had white experiences, but then had just been denied the last two or three decades of mortality progress. Um, so this is an extreme gap um, in mortality. And so that was the context for me asking the question, how does this gap compare with COVID? Um, so how many excess deaths among whites in the COVID-19 pandemic would raise white mortality to reach the best ever black levels? Is it going to be true that the story about 1918 where the white experience of 1918 was actually better than the black experience was typically, is that, is that true today? Um, and the way I answered this was by creating a series of counterfactual models where I raised white mortality um, up to the best ever black levels. Um, and the best ever black levels were from 2014, uh, actually same for whites, um, which is, it was before the opioid pandemic came into full swing. Um, so things have been getting worse since 2014. Um, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm taking these, uh, white mortality values from 2017 and I'm raising them up to, to in the aggregate look like uh, 2014 um, black levels. Um, and, um, and I'm doing this in, um, you can see by the way that I switched the colors here across graphs, which is terrible graphing practice. Um, if I were my own student, I would say, you have to redo this and I will redo that. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing I just want to say is, so I'm, I'm doing this also in uh, age standardized mortality, because even though the difference is not as extreme in the United States as a whole as in Minnesota, um, these are still pretty big age differences where the white population is just a lot older 
than the black population. Okay. And so in order to answer this question, how many deaths do you need in order for this white line to get pulled up to be more like the black line, um, you have to assign, you have to make some assumption about what ages are those deaths happening at. Um, and it's hard to think like, what is the right assumption to make about what ages excess deaths in 2020 would be happening at? We don't really have the data yet. And that was even truer several months ago when I was uh, beginning this research. Um, so what assumption should I use? So I ended up making two different assumptions that both seemed reasonable. Um, and one is that excess mortality in 2020 would have the same age shape as normal mortality. Um, and so that's the purple boxes here. And the other is that it would have the same age shape as COVID mortality estimated from CDC data. So these are the confirmed COVID deaths um, and that's these mint green shapes. Um, and so I run these different models with these different assumptions about what ages the excess deaths are happening at and figure out well, how big does that excess value have to be um, in order for the white rates or the white life expectancy to end up looking like the best ever black values. And then I backtrack, well, okay, now that I have the rates, how many deaths is that? Um, so long story short, um, this gives me this range of estimates um, that is telling me that for this white 2017 death rate, age standardized death rate, to be dragged up to the lowest ever black 2014 level is about 400,000 excess deaths. Um, uh, so meaning that it would take about 400,000 deaths um, to white people through all pathways. Um, so COVID deaths, excess mortality from hospitals, all those things that we saw in the earlier graphs for Minnesota, it would take 400,000 of those deaths to whites in the United States um, for mortality to end up looking like the best that black mortality has ever been. Um, and to, for white life expectancy to be pulled down to the best that black life expectancy has ever been would take perhaps a million deaths, um, and which is a larger number because all of these deaths are happening at older ages um, that don't affect the average lifespan, uh, that, that one by one don't affect the average lifespan all that much. Okay. So I'm gonna spend the rest of this talk elaborating on what I think I, we learned from these results. So this would be a good time if you have questions about what the results are or how I got them. This would be a good time for those questions. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, I'm curious about um, whether these results range are based on the two different assumptions or do the two different assumptions give you different death counts that aren't shown here or just talk through um, what those different results were? The first, so in, so in these results, the low figure is the um, uh, assumption that uh, reflects the assumption that COVID mortality looks like all cause mortality and the higher number of deaths is reflecting the assumption that um, the excess mortality looks like confirmed COVID mortality. So like the, the mint bars. And the reason why assuming an older um, age pattern of deaths ends up requiring more deaths um, in order for the age standardized rates to be equalized is that because the white population is the oldest population in the US, the age standard, so the age standard I used is the full population of Minnesota. And so the age standardized rates are applying an age uh, distribution that is a little bit younger than the white population, um, which ends up meaning that the, the deaths happening at above average age count like slightly less than, than one and the deaths happening at younger ages count slightly more. Does that make sense? Yeah, that answers my question, thanks. So I would say like stepping back from the detail, I should say too, I didn't put this on the slide, but I also did this. There's another um, demographic technique for standardizing mortality, which is called an indirect age standardization. 
and it's, I think, not as good. Um, but I did that as well just to see what the results are. And it was something like 471,000 deaths. Um, and the nice thing about that method, which overall I think is less good, is for this purpose, it actually has the nice feature that it does not require any assumption about the age distribution of deaths. Um, and so what I'm taking from this is that because these, this range is very close, and then the, the one that is not using any assumption about the age distribution of deaths is higher than these, um, that makes me feel pretty confident that this 400,000 value is, is not an overestimate, um, that it's, if anything, a kind of conservative estimate. Um, and then the life expectancy estimates are going to be much more sensitive to what exact assumption you make about the ages when deaths occur. Any other questions about this part? Okay, cool. So I'm going to use the rest of this talk to elaborate on what I think we get from this. Um, and um, so what do we learn from comparing racial disparities to pandemics? What's the larger significance here? Um, and I want to um, use this question to um, try to outline a research agenda um, that I would say I'm at a, like a very preliminary stage at. And so this is a stage where feedback is very useful. Um, and it starts from two different kinds of answers that I have to this question. Um, and one is that these results, um, the, the comparison to pandemics uh, is meaningful because it denaturalizes the inequality. And, and putting it this way, it was actually um, not my own idea, but something that I got from uh, my colleague, Enid Logan, um, who looked at the initial results and said like, this is a really good way to denaturalize the inequality, the racial inequality and mortality. And I thought that's exactly what I'm trying to do, but I hadn't had um, that way of putting it. And so what I mean is, um, you know, thinking back to like the reaction that I had to the 1918 flu result where, you know, it changed the way I, I understood those talks that we have every semester or every year that are talking about the unprecedented and unique mortality experience of 1918. And to know that actually that was some people's typical experience. Um, uh, it, it really affected the way that I, I, I thought, not just about racial inequality, but about uh, mortality more generally. Um, and um, so that's one kind of answer is, um, and the other kind of answer is that pandemics are really connected um, with social action. So we change our lives to stop them. And that doesn't mean that we always do this easily or without controversy. Um, this is a quote that I love from 1918 that one of my fabulous undergraduate research assistants found. Um, uh, uh, both, uh, so this is from a Kansas newspaper article. Um, he's saying both the health commissioner and the health officer have been the target during the last few months for gobs of criticism and insubordination against what was termed the autocracy they were establishing in depriving the citizens of the privilege of freedom of action, the right to mingle with flu germs. Um, so this, of course, uh, we may think feels a little familiar. Um, so it's, it's, it's not the case that the things we do to stop a respiratory pandemic, uh, including lockdowns, school shutdowns, forced quarantine, forced masking, it's not the case that these things are not controversial or that we take the scale of action that, that um, some of us think that we should. Um, but the fundamental point is that on some level we are doing these things um, and that we have really changed our entire way of life um, in order to stop the spread of COVID as witnessed by the fact that we're here having this conversation where I'm standing in my home um, instead of in our school. And so this really invites the question to me about what if we were as serious about stopping deaths associated with racism as we are about stopping deaths associated with the pandemic. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we are not. So um, the, the thing that stands out to me the most about the response to COVID 
is how quickly what is imaginable to us changed. Because even at the beginning of March last year, um, you know, I, I went on a trip, right? Like the idea of um, stopping even something as frivolous as a vacation, um, let alone of reorganizing the way our workplaces work, the way our families work was sort of unimaginable. And within a matter of weeks, what seems not just imaginable to me, but essential had radically reoriented itself. And that was true, I think, for most of us. Um, and yet we resist that kind of radical reorientation. So when we talk about proposals like defunding the police or school integration proposals, um, for example, I think it's common that the response is like, well, that's not really pragmatic. That's not politically feasible. It's not tenable. Um, and it's as though when it comes to fighting racism, we try to box our imagination into the limits of what is acceptable with what looks basically like the status quo that we have, but tweaked um, instead of the way that we, um, to confront the pandemic said, we actually need to do something that's very fundamentally different and start not from how do we maintain our lives as close as possible to how they have been, but start from what would it actually look like to stop this disease. Um, and so I want to explore what would it look like if we had that same approach to fighting racism. Um, and the particular policy that I um, want to explore is um, the idea of um, reparations for, um, for these inequalities in health. Um, and the backdrop here is that the idea of reparations has become increasingly um, uh, prominent in discussion over the last six years, um, uh, really since the publication of this 2014 article. Um, there's a lot of active discussion about reparations. Um, this book came out last year. This one came out this year. Uh, this article was this year. So there's this kind of accelerating discussion. Um, and one of the things that these kind of detailed reparations proposals, the book length versions, of course, are especially detailed. One of the things that they have in common is that all of these are targeted toward equalizing wealth or in some way compensating for the losses of wealth that were associated with slavery. And on one level, I think that makes complete sense, because if you asked me to pick a single proxy for power, wealth would be my answer. Um, so how much power you have to shape your environment, um, how much power you have to resist other people's power over you, I think wealth is the number one proxy of that. Um, and so it makes sense to target that in particular. Um, so I think that wealth-based reparations, I support them and I think that they're essential. Um, but I also have started to think about what are ways in which wealth-based um, policies might be insufficient to combat uh, what we're talking about when we talk about the loss of life. Um, and so the argument I want to make is that the loss of life is a really distinctive kind of loss um, that has a few different facets that I want to draw out. Uh, and one of those is about time. And I want to argue that in the same way that wealth is the proxy for power, that maybe our control over our time is our best proxy for freedom. Um, and the loss of life is not the only way that we have set up our society to systematically devalue um, people's time in their lives, right? So we actually steal time in all kinds of ways. So you should be thinking here about uh, work that doesn't feel meaningful because the people who are doing it are excluded from any kind of decision-making over it, um, treated as, as tools rather than as, uh, as agents. Um, you should be thinking about the time that is lost um, uh, to um, the way that government bureaucracies force people accessing social services to waste their time, uh, time that's lost in, to commuting or to just-in-time job scheduling. So all of these different things, and you should certainly absolutely be thinking about incarceration 
and the lifetime that is lost in the most extreme forms of not having control um, over your life, right? But then underneath all of those is the simple kind of fact of how long we live. And there are other aspects of time, uh, sorry, other aspects of loss of life um, that I am thinking about as well. So our lives are also, our lifespans are also about our connections to other people, um, including connections that can only, by their nature, can only exist um, through longevity because they are intergenerational. So like this article that I put up um, is about the loss to the experience of kin loss um, and the profound racial inequality that there is in losing a parent um, at a young age, losing a child, uh, losing siblings. Um, and so there's a very distinctive kind of loss um, to not knowing um, your, your relatives. Um, and I would argue that part of what we get through aging is actually the distinctive experience of like experiencing ourselves at different stages of life. Um, and so that's not just about the total amount of time, but it's something that sort of by its structure can only happen when it's unspooled um, over decades. The way that we get to reconceptualize ourselves and our concerns and our kind of life projects in different ways through the accumulation of experience. Another way to put that would be we get to learn. And so like, what is the loss to us when that is taken away? Um, and then there are kind of these pragmatic um, uh, losses that are not just to ourselves, but to others. Um, so not just to our kin, um, but to our polity, right? So this is an article estimating um, how many uh, elections would have gone a different way if uh, black people in the United States had the mortality rates of white people. Um, and, a, and another piece that I'm sort of just starting to think about that is fundamental, I think, to, to a life course understanding of development um, is thinking about wisdom and the way that older people tend to have synthetic ideas, um, have a different approach um, to understanding ideas um, and, to, uh, and to stories. Um, and these are losses that we don't have a great way to, um, to quantify, right? And so, but the, the picture I'm trying to paint here is that in demography, when we talk about mortality disparities, um, it's pretty arid, right? We count up lives or at best we count up years. And so part of the project that I'm imagining is thinking more seriously about what are the losses in human terms um, to, that are associated with early death, and can we use that to further this project um, of denaturalizing um, inequality? And then, oops, sorry, I'm missing a slide here. Um, but so the other piece of, uh, of the project is what would it, what what would redress for that look like? Um, so going back to the question of reparations, um, what what could wealth based reparations not accomplish that would have to be accomplished through other means. Um, and so an example is, so in a, another way to put that is, what can your wealth not buy you out of um, when it comes to inequality in lifespan? And so one example is all the ways that racism is built into medical care, um, into doctors that take black pain less seriously than white pain, um, that have racist ideas and treat patients with hostility and suspicion. Um, wealth obviously by itself won't make doctors less racist. Um, so what would it look like to have a reparations program targeted to health that involves a mass infusion of investment into um, equalizing medical care? Um, the percent of doctors in the United States who were black around 1980 was about 5%. Does anyone wanna guess what it is today? Still 5%? It, it is still 5%. I don't know who said that, but you're right. Um, that was Audrey. Has, thanks, Audrey. 
Um, Audrey is correct. Uh, it's still 5%. It hasn't budged at all. Um, and the, the other piece I'm really thinking about is pollution. So we have this growing body of research about how serious air pollution in particular is for a whole range of health outcomes, particularly those that affect children, um, that affect um, uh, babies in utero. Um, and so the mechanism by which wealth lets you buy your way out of pollution is through moving, right? It's by changing neighborhoods. But there's actually a lot of reason why people might not want to move. We have real ties to where we grow up and to the people where we grow up. Um, and so, you know, the right to move is a, is a very, it, it, it's a very fundamental right that actually has been at the core of almost all civil rights struggles, right? The right to access better neighborhoods um, in the post-Civil War period. Um, but also we might think about what would it look like to fight for a right to stay where you are, but have it be safe. Um, and so we can imagine reparations as a kind of concerted effort um, to clean up neighborhoods. Um, uh, we can imagine reparations um, as, uh, as workplace targeted. Right? So one of the things I think has emerged in this pandemic in a more serious way is um, uh, when I teach my diseases, disasters, and other killers class, I have a, a ton of pre-med students and public health students. And every semester I ask them, how many of you in your other public health kinds of classes have learned about workplaces as a big determinant of what your health is like or how long you'll live? And it's always crickets, nobody has. And I, I think the COVID pandemic has made it very obvious that that's wrong and that workplaces have been kind of missing from too much of our thinking about health because it's so obvious how who's an essential worker uh, structures how much risk people have in the pandemic. Um, but the, the, core, um, the core argument that I'm making is that when our starting question is not what policies could we have that would tweak racism around the edges? But if our starting question is, what would it look like to say that these disparities are unacceptable and to attack them with the vigor that we attack COVID, um, that the policies that we end up with are not ones that focus on the disadvantaged and their behavior, um, but ones that ask uh, more fundamental questions about what would it about uh, how we could reorganize society um, with the presumption that these disparities shouldn't exist at all? And so that's the research agenda that um, very in a very broad sense that I'm trying to embark on. And I would appreciate everybody's feedback about uh, where to go next. stops the screen sharing so that I can see the chat, but I guess I'll just go back to it if we need um, to look at slides again. Uh, looks like we have a question from Jacqueline Bates. Jacqueline, if you want to ask your question. Um, hi, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say this work is amazing and it's really moving to see how much like heart you put into it. I've seen like your other talks on this as well. And I always find it really moving. Um, I wanted to ask, my question has to do with, with two points. One being like sort of the measures of racism. Um, and then also like, if you if we could talk about like the underlying causal mechanism for how like racism is translating into these health disparities that you outlined. So in this work on like COVID and excess mortality, race is the proxy for racism. I mean, we don't really get to see like, what, like it's obviously not race that's causing the death, right? And so um, with COVID, we've all been told over and over again that it had to do with age and um, pre-existing conditions, but we know that pre-existing conditions are like related to race. We also know that like the, the people's interactions with the healthcare system and what care they're like able to access would would affect their health outcomes as well. So I guess I, I was just hoping you could comment on like 
what you think are like the primary causal mechanisms and and how we would even be able to tease that apart because I think that when we, we're just looking at like the race and like the differences in health based on race it's very easy as like a scapegoat to say like well those people have pre-existing conditions they have diabetes or whatever and to not really address like how racism is causing those health disparities um thanks Okay, so there's a, a lot here, and I think I want to say three things because um, uh, these are uh, extremely good questions. Um, so the first thing I want to say is about in terms of what's the mechanisms is that even when it comes to proximate mechanisms, I think there's a lot more that we still have to learn. Um, so I'm still pretty early in trying to read like more systematically in this area because it's a really big area. Um, but one of the things um, that stands out uh, in the, the like sort of enormous literature on racial disparities in health is that you have like every proximate mechanism imaginable implicated in some way. Um, but we have very few attempts at kind of a synthesis at looking at what matters the most or how do these things matter in relation to each other or like which causal levers seem especially meaningful and which seem weaker. Um, and that strikes me as a huge problem. And I think that it reflects in part that it's a very daunting um, inferential question to try to sort that out when the point is that things like how much wealth you have and what neighborhood you live in and how you get treated by teachers when you're young and how you're treated by the criminal justice system are so enmeshed with each other that it's very hard to separate them. But it also seems like um, if you want to actually figure out how to address these, um, that, that we have to kind of uh, confront that head on. So that's one response I have. Um, the second is, I think part of what you're asking is, what kind of evidence is a disparity really? Um, and this is a really important question. So the number one question that I have gotten um, in presenting work like this uh, out loud or uh, in written form, um, the number one question from people who are more skeptical of it, of the argument is, well, like, why are you saying that um, these disparities are about racism? Um, if you look at disparities between white and Asian Americans, uh, Asian Americans on average live longer, does that mean there's racism against white people? Um, which I don't think that there is, right? So what kind of evidence are disparities? Um, and my response has been that when you have a part of your population that is um, systematically excluded from the best of everything, schools, neighborhoods, that's confronted um, with contempt and violence by state agencies across the board that is treated contemptuously by the medical system and so on and so forth that's put in the worst jobs. Um, and then lo and behold, those people don't live so long as long as everybody else, your starting assumption should be that that disparity reflects racism. Um, but I think that there is kind of more um, sort of like philosophy of social science thinking to be done here about what we actually do and don't learn from disparities and what the implicit counterfactual is. So just one thing I'll say briefly about that is in demography, like in very different contexts, we sometimes use the concept of um, uh, best case life expectancy. So it's usually looking at national populations. So like we look at Japan and see how long their life expectancy is. And we use that to understand what's possible. And in the same kind of way, I think that white life expectancy in the US shows us what is possible. Um, and I would argue actually an impoverished view of what is possible um, uh, if you think that um, a society that confronted uh, its anti-Black racism in a serious way would also be one that wasn't so hostile to social welfare programs that actually might extend to everybody's lives. So this is a kind of minimal view of, of, of the lifespan that it's possible for a society like ours to offer um, to populations on average. And then the third thing to say about the question about like, you know, uh, the way we've talked about COVID risks about being about age and pre-existing conditions. One thing that stands out to me is like, so uh, 
a general framework for thinking about who dies of an infectious disease is to break that into two parts. Who gets exposed and how resistant are they to exposure? So how likely are they to survive if they get exposed? And most of the public discussion, I think, about racial disparities has been about the resistance piece. Um, so the, 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 you know, the comorbidities, um, et cetera. Um, and I think it's too early to say this for sure, but the evidence that I'm seeing from different studies suggests that actually in the case of COVID, the exposure piece is probably where more of the action is. Uh, and so it really is about uh, essential workers and about um, who's living in crowded housing and multi-generational housing. Uh, more than it is about who um, can resist the pandemic once exposed. So that's a whole mess of answers to your, um, your great questions, Jacqueline. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, looks like we have a question in the chat here. Um, Okay, so Liz asks, um, what do I think about modifying the ACA to have greater insurance subsidies for groups with worse health outcomes? Um, I think that's a great idea. I think there's a lot of ways you could think about using ACA metrics. Um, so, cause one of the things that the ACA did that I think we talk about less than the kind of universal, uh, universalizing is overstating it, but the expansion of insurance, um, Another thing that the ACA did is impose all of these health metrics, um, performance metrics onto insurance, but also really on hospitals um, in order for them to keep their funding. And I think that the outcomes of that are mixed. Um, and so there's like some parts of that that have, I think, been very positive, like um, hospitals, like one of the metrics that they get evaluated on now is how well they respond to patient complaints. Um, and it seems like it does actually make them more responsive. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. Um, but there's also a lot of unintended consequences. So like if you're measuring a hospital by how well the people who they treat do on average, it gives them a lot of incentive to try to game that uh, metric by only treating people who they can treat well. And, and actually, like it, it seems as though um, responding to metrics like that have guided a lot of hospital decisions about like refusing to treat or finding ways out of treating um, the patients who actually need treatment the most. And so this is all a long way of saying that I think the idea of um, sort of like building in, um, building in uh, equity um, assessments into something like um, the ACA is like both a really interesting idea and also one where, sh where we should be kind of wary um, because of the way that metrics always end up getting gamed. Um, you know, the other way we could think about insurance is that um, there's a, a, a lot of argument in different contexts that the most effective policies to treat racial disparities are ones that are universal. Um, and I think that that is likely to be true with insurance also. Um, and that like, uh, in many ways, the most effective programs might be ones that just, uh, made insurance truly universal in the way that the ACA did not. That's my gut reaction. Thanks. Thank you. There's no other questions in the chat. Does anyone have one? Oh, now there is. Okay, so Julia says two comments. One, thinking about this from a cumulative disadvantage perspective. Um, what would this give us for think, understanding the accumulation of health disadvantage occurs over the life course? So identifying inflection points where the timing of interventions would yield the largest bang for our buck. Um, I really agree with that. I think it's a really, uh, I think it's an important way to kind of organize how to proceed in this literature where the results tend to end up saying like everything matters, right? So that's what's sort of overwhelming about this literature is like you have a million different studies about different factors and 
basically what they amount to is that like every aspect of the way our society is organized is unequal and furthers inequality. And then it does create this sort of issue about well, where would you even begin then um, in, designing, uh, in designing policies to address or ameliorate that. And so I, I think it's right to look for inflection points uh, as a way to kind of get at what are the fundamental things that are really mattering and then the way that I'm a little bit torn about what I'm saying is that I also think that sometimes when we talk about cumulative disadvantage, there can be a tendency to become um, very passive about harms that have already happened. So to say, for example, um, that um, if the places where we get the biggest bang for our buck are in very early childhood interventions, um, to, to extrapolate from that to saying that when people are a little older, we can't do anything. Um, and I think you could see this in some widespread responses to the poisoning of the popul black population of Flint, Michigan, um, through its water supply being very unsafe. Um, there, was, there was this tendency to talk about the children who then had these extremely unsafe lead levels as though you know their lives were sort of irreparably ruined. And, I think there is some danger in kind of like adopting that fatalism instead of saying like, well, actually we don't know that like, a, a, you know, a, a better response might be to say, these are children who need to be flooded with resources um, to try to overcome the way that they were poisoned. Um, so I, I, I guess that's just to say that like, I, I both think that a, a life course and developmental approach is right. And I also am a little bit leery about the way that I feel like um, some of those cumulative disadvantage theories have been um, deployed in practice. All right, we have time for one more question. All right, well, I guess we'll end two minutes early. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the wonderful talk. Thanks everyone. Um, the, like I said, I'm early in this um, kind of thinking about what to do next. So feel free to send me emails with thoughts and I will be appreciative.